Psalms chapter number 16. We'll begin reading in verse number eight, or verse number seven. I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life, and thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now, starting off in verse number 1, Psalm of David. And this psalm's got <laughs> everything. It's got praise. It's got prophecy. It's got a little bit of it all. Okay, but by the time we get down to verse number 7, he's talking about praising the Lord. I mean, our pastor preached not too many weeks ago on what does it mean to bless the Lord. Well, it means to bring, bring praise, honor, and glory unto. All right, well... I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. God is not a harsh dictator. Right? If you sincerely entreat Him, asking Him for guidance, He won't smack you down with you know, a yes or a no. He will counsel thee. He will explain it to where you understand it. A dictator dictates, a counselor counsels. It says, here's what the Word says. Here's what the word will say. Here's why the word's right. All right? What was that? That was a little bit of what our passages did. The counsel to make sure not just here's what's right and wrong. Here's why it's right and wrong. Okay. Then verse number, or the second half of that. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. Now, you know, I may not admit it every now and then, but I do need to use a dictionary every now and then. Right? Reins threw me off for a second there, brother Clint. Reins are not reins as in horse reins. Right? That's got a G in it. Right? This one, no, this, this is different. Reins. Well, literally, it's talking about kidneys. Okay, figuratively, it's talking about the seat of emotion, those inward places in your life Amen. where you store those things that are most precious to you. Right? What did. Jesus said the great commandment was that thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. What's that saying? Everything in you. Okay, that's what reigns are. That's where you keep those things that are precious, those things that are sacred to you. Okay, you guard them. What did David say? Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. He safeguarded it in those places. So when he says, my reigns instruct me in the night season, he's saying, I put the word of God in me so that those nights granted this is David who lived in caves right on the run from Saul the one that had the heart of the people stolen away from him by his son Absalom right what did he have to do then he had to go back on the run right there were times that David couldn't get to the house of God but he's saying in those dark times in my life I've hidden the word of God in my heart so that even then I have God's instruction I've taken his counsel and it's so precious to me, I've hidden it in my heart that I won't forget it so that even in the dark times, I can continue to do what God wants me to do. Right then, verse number 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because He is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Well, we'll get to it here in a second. Don't want to skip ahead. Okay, but the Lord always before me What's that? That's surrender, which we heard about preached in, you know, this past week. Right? Brother Cody talking about it. if you've got a problem submitting, doesn't matter what else somebody else tries to teach you. Unless God's Lord of your life, you're going to have issues. Anything else isn't going to work. Right? Then, he says, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Now, is David saying that I'm standing at the left hand of the God? No, that's not what he's saying here. Okay, because in order for God to be on his right hand, that'd mean that he'd have to be on the left of God. That's not what David's saying. David was king. Right? David understood that there are optics to being the king. Okay, people look at the king. Right? Who stands next to the king? The one that has a special place of 
honor or respect. Okay, David's not, not saying the, I'm at the Lord's left hand, but he is saying that the Lord's at my right hand. That's saying that's that special place of honor in my life. Right? That's why I put the thing that is most sacred to me, that I want to bring glory and attention to, that I want to magnify, that I want to show the rest of the world that this is worth having. Right? So he's saying the Lord's at my right hand. In other words, all he's saying is I've given the Lord the most treasured place in my life. That place that you know, I give my attention to, that thing that I desire, the thing that I seek after. Why do you think the Lord's always before him? Because David's given him the most special place in his heart to the Lord. He's saying he's always before me because he's the thing that I desire most. That's what he means when he says that the Lord is at my right hand. He's saying, I've given the most dignified, the most reserved place. Not to himself. Because the king could have sat on the throne. Right? But no, if he sits on the throne, he had guards. Nobody else could come up to it. Right In heaven, there are cherubims that guard the throne of God. Right? But the place next to the king, he's saying, I'll even get out of the way to show off the one that I'm giving the right hand to. The one that I'm putting on display. In fact, there have been times throughout history that in order to show utter respect, a king or a monarch, if this is someone that he loves, or someone that has done a great deed for him, someone that may have been a, you know, a, a great leader in battle, won a great victory, that the king would, as a sign of respect, allow that one to sit on his throne just for a moment. But he would even yield his own seat to the one that he loved. Well, what's David saying? I got off the throne, and he, I'm just standing next to what God gave me, and I'm overjoyed at how God's doing a whole lot better job sitting on the throne than I am. He said, he's got the most special place in my heart. But then... Verse number 9. Okay, therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. Why is he glad in his heart? Why does his glory rejoice? Because the Lord, in verse number 8, because he's at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Because I've given everything to God, I can't be moved off of what God gave me. Unless God takes it, but then I'm not being moved. The Lord's just redirecting me. Right? He's doing something new. He's doing something different. He's saying, God's got it all in control, so my heart will be glad. Because I know, I'm, he's written here, how much he loves God, but he's saying, I know how much God loves me. And if he loves me as much as he does, everything's going to be okay. My heart will be glad. My glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. In other words, he's saying, anxiety ain't going to be chewing me up all the time. I may have times where I worry, but I'm going to be able to live and rest in the hope of God. In verse 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Okay, the second part of that verse is prophecy. That's why holy one is capitalized. Who's David writing about? Christ. And hell, in Hebrew, Sheol, didn't mean the charred region of the damned that in the New Testament that word used for. It means the grave. So he's saying, I may die off, but I know God's not going to leave me in the ground. Because one day he's got one coming that isn't going to see the corruption of the flesh that I've had to deal with. I won't have to deal with sin. And he will not only redeem me, He'll take me with him to glory. I'm not going to be in the ground for all of eternity. That's why he's resting in hope. His hope wasn't in what he could do, wasn't in what God would do for him. His hope was in the Holy One. Right? When we get to the point where we're not expecting God to do something for us, or when we're not expecting that God's going to show up and clear the problem, David wasn't resting in hope because he believed that he'd have smooth sailing. David wasn't resting in hope because he thought that, well, with God, I'll have an easier life. He's saying, I rest in hope because I know the one that's Alpha and Omega. Doesn't matter what happens to me, he's still God. So I'll rest in hope. Okay, then, verse number 11. 
Thou wilt show me the path of life. Did not Jesus say that he came to give life and life more abundantly? In thy presence is fullness of joy. After love, what's the first fruit of the Spirit? Joy. Right? You will abound in joy. But then at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Well, here again, second time. We've heard about the right hand, except this time it's not talking about David's right hand. It's talking about God's right hand. And David's saying, I have learned that at the right hand of God, there are pleasures forevermore. Now, there's a few different ways we can look at this. Who is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven? God, Jesus. He said that he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Well, certainly there are a whole bunch of pleasures in Christ. Right? Redemption and forgiveness of sins. Right? The fact that he's been made our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. That he made one sacrifice and then presented that sacrifice to God in such a manner that no sacrifice has to ever be made again. I mean, we heard a little bit about that with Brother Daniel on Friday night, that the priest's job were to make the sacrifices of what God organized and required in order for sins to be pushed back. But when God did the sacrifice with the Holy One that we read about in verse number 10, right, it's so good that no more sacrifice. Right? There's, there's a whole lot of joy there's a whole lot of pleasure in that thought okay there's a whole lot of pleasures in Christ himself right that he's the friend that will never leave us nor forsake us right that he was tempted at all points like we are yet was he without sin he overcame everything and as the apostle Paul said yet not I live it but Christ liveth in me so if he overcame it in his life and I'm allowing Christ to live through me he'll overcome it in my life there's pleasures Right, but we're not going to go that deep. I wanted to, but God said no. So we're not going to look at the pleasures in Christ. But then, since Christ is seated, on, I know you guys are looking at me, it's going to be on your left, okay? But if Christ is seated on the right hand of God, that means that the Son's left hand is on the Father's right hand side. Okay, so just bear with me here for a second. What did Jesus say? That we are in His hand, His hands in the Father's hand, and no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. But in order for the Son's hand to be in the Father's hand, if He's seated at the right hand of God, that means that Jesus' left hand's right here, and I'm in that hand. I mean, Brother Harris preached on that, the hollow of His hand, right? But if that's where we are, that means that the right hand of God's coming over like this. And we're in the hands of God. Well, what did verse number 11 say? That will show me the path of life and the presence of the fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Right? If we are see it, which again, that's a picture of the sealing of our salvation, that it's complete, that God on this side, God on this side, and we're in the middle. Ain't nobody going to be able to get to us. Right, that's eternal security. But if we're in the left hand of Christ, and he said that his hand was in the Father's hand, and the right hand of God is over top of us, and the Scripture says that at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore, why do we get so down? We're in the right hand of God. And at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We're in the very place that we can have the time of our lives. So why aren't we? Right? Why do we have those moments where David's saying, everything's lined up. He's going on, he's praising God that God's orchestrated everything in his life that he learned at a very young age. He's out there watching the sheep that if you give that special place, that place of honor in your life to God, God's going to give you a life full of pleasures. But yet even in David's life, what happens at Ziklag? He gets there and his own men who have forsaken everything. The life that they used to have, the friends, the family, right? They're on the run with David. They get back to Ziklag and everything that they love has been taken from them. And even they start murmuring, maybe we should kill David and head on back home. 
right? Why, when we're in the pleasures of God all the time, do those things happen? Right? Well, it's not because of God. It's because of us. Right? You do realize that Adam and Eve got to walk with God in the cool of the day in the garden? Not spiritually walk as we do by faith. He doesn't blow, you know, blow through the garden like he does around here where God will just sit down among us and you know, show out a little bit. No, no, no. He walked by and they walked with him. They heard the very audible voice of God. And yet even that pleasure of walking with them in the cool of the day, they still got to the point where the pleasures of God weren't what they desired. And then eventually, I mean, we've heard it preached, why was there a serpent in the garden if Adam was supposed to be tending in the garden? Right? Long before the serpent ever tempted Eve, Adam neglected his duties. Right? Why? Because they weren't satisfied with the pleasures of God. Why? Why? Well, first off, sin came. Anytime that there's sin in your life, you're ostracized from the pleasures of God. Man cannot serve two masters. I love one and hate the other. And if sin means more than you, then having God in that seat of honor and respect in your life, you're not going to have the pleasures of God. Right? Well, we all know that. Brother Jordan, this is Sunday morning. We've heard that before. I know, but we still had to mention it. Right? Because if I regard iniquity in my heart, he will not even hear my prayers, let alone how can I enjoy the pleasures of God if I can't even talk to him? Because there's something between me and him. Right? But the pleasures of God, it says forevermore. What does that mean? No matter what, I can always delight in the pleasures of God if things are right with God. Right? You want to know when you stop enjoying the pleasures of God? When you stop listening to the one that's giving you instruction. You want to know why people started using different Bibles? Because they didn't care what God said anymore and they were tired of being convicted whenever somebody would get up and preach what thus saith the Lord. You want to know why people use false versions of the Bible? They can sit there, somebody can teach or preach out of it all day long and it doesn't bother them where they live. It's not watered down. It's got all the power taken out of it. You know how many times they removed the blood of Jesus Christ in new translations? You know I mean? <sighs> Don't have time to get into all of it. But they take out whole, the whole second half of the chapter, the last chapter of the book of Mark. They have Jesus dying on the cross and then end of the story. They left out the resurrection of Jesus. You're telling me that's a God? You're telling me that God intended for there to be doubt on whether or not Jesus got up out of the ground? Right? I'm not saying that, you know, people come in and you, know, you can't delight in the pleasures of God if you're not in the house of God. Duh. If you're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, you're disobeying God. That's sin. We already talked about that. Well, I'm talking about people that come in. They may not do it consciously. But because God doesn't have that place of honor in their life, because God isn't at their right hand, they're not delighting in the pleasures of God's right hand. They sit there and they hear things, and it just rolls in one ear and out the other because they've heard it before and they've rejected it before. You can become callous to preaching. Where you can sit there and you can amen at the things that you're okay with, and then all of a sudden things will get really quiet. Anybody else ever notice that? I love it. Most of the time it means that people are thinking. Right? But there are some people, everybody else may keep shouting, but there's one person, and they don't agree, and then they're going to be quiet the rest of the service. Right? Well, what happened? Did God stop being so good between point one and point two? Right? Is the word any less true? No. But why? Because all of a sudden they've realized they got a bird in their saddle and they're trying to decide whether or not they want to get it made right. I mean, we talked about it last week. What happened when David was confronted by the man of God and said, Thou art the man. You're the one that took somebody else's sheep and then killed the guy, the shepherd of the sheep because you wanted that sheep so badly. 
As soon as he heard it, what did he do? He went and he got it made right. Not, oh man, i got to think about this on whether or not I'm really sorry about this. No, 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 immediately. Because he had lost all the pleasure in his life because he was no longer staying in it, but he was no longer over there enjoying the pleasures of God that come from his right hand. Why? Because God couldn't bless him because David had disobeyed God. If God's really in that treasured place of your life, if he's really seated in your heart as the Lord of Lord, King of Kings, it doesn't matter what he said, you'll do it immediately. You want to know why so many people, so many Christians, have a life where they have no pleasure, they have no joy, they have no laughter, or mirth as the Bible would call it. Right? They can't delight in the things of God, let alone anything, in the th anything out in the world. You know why? Because they've got a problem just giving everything to God. They've got a problem with when God says jump, you say how high. Right? Well, I may not be able to do much, but if God tells me to jump, I'll jump. I may get a centimeter off the ground, but if He tells me to jump, I'll jump. Right? What was Jonah's problem? All right, Lord, I'll go to Nineveh. Heads in the exact opposite direction. Now, I was going to Nineveh by boat. Nineveh wasn't by the water. Right? He was trying to talk himself out of going. Or, you know what? Maybe God wanted me to go there next year. I got, I got something planned already. Well, God didn't say go, go there now. Well, why else would God tell you to go? Right? God is a God of the present. That's why He's... You know, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it's one thing for him to be Alpha. It's one thing for him to be Omega. But he's always here. That's why today is the day that the Lord has made. Not tomorrow. But if there's fullness of joy in God's presence. If there's pleasure at his right hand forevermore, why would we ever want to move away from the right hand? Think of it like a kitchen faucet. And one of the old ones that didn't turn like the new ones do. Right? If it's got a faucet that goes up and over, you can put the bucket wherever you want to, unless it's underneath of the faucet, it ain't going to get blessed. It ain't going to have pleasure. Right? You could go out and pump an old well all day long, but unless the bucket is out underneath of the spigot, you ain't getting no water. And there's so many people working for the pleasure, it's not in work. It's in obedience. It's not in how much I can give to God. It's in loving and respecting and revering God enough that when He says, I do. And it's not a, I do sometimes. It's I do either all of it or I'm not doing any of it. Reading the Word of God's not going to do you much good if you already know that you're going to go out and you're going to live a way that God's not proud of, that you're going to go out and you're going to associate with people that God doesn't want you to associate with, and instead of being the salt of the earth and the light of the earth, you're just going to go out and get covered in the mud of the earth. You can sit there and read all that. You're not going to get a spiritual blessing out of that. Why? Because you know that there's business that needs to take place with God that hadn't taken place already. I mean, are we not supposed to do all things as unto Christ? You know what that means? You're supposed to do it as if Christ asked you to. You want to know why so many Christians have a bad testimony? They don't live the things to Christ that Christ asked them to live. How are they going to look at somebody else and say, I'm going to do it to them like I would unto Christ? Well, that means you're going to treat them like garbage. Because that's how most of us treat Christ throughout the week. Right? David, he's not saying that every day was perfect. But when he was right with God, there were pleasures every day. There was joy. He may have been in a cave, but he had God with him. Right? Why do so many people forsake the pleasures of God? Why do they get to that point where they can take God or leave God? I mean, I thank Him for saving me, but really don't need Him until you know time comes for me to die and I need to go to heaven. You say, that's not the case. Well, people may not say that because they know better. Right? They don't want to get looked at funny. But if you look at the story and the testimony of their life, that's what they're saying. I'll, I'll show up every now and then. I'll show up when we're having church. 
But I'm not going to have personal devotion. I'm not going to do something outside of church that would benefit the church because I just want to come up or show up, get in on it, and then get out. Go back to what I was doing. That's why they have no pleasure in life. The old adage, they can... Everything that they bite into it turns into ash in their mouth. Right, that was... Who was it? Oh, yeah. King Midas, every, he wished that everything that he touched turned to gold. Well, that included all the food that he ate. As soon as it touched his lips or it touched his tongue, it turned to gold. He couldn't eat it. He had everything that he ever wanted, and then he realized it wasn't really what he wanted. But how many Christians never realize that hit and miss or partial, or let's just call it, like the pastor said, if you take the things of God and you change it, to make you happy, what have you done? You've perverted the things of God. Amen. And you're walking around with perversions in your life and you're wondering why there's no pleasure. Amen. Because God only uses and does things one way, His way. Amen. There are pleasures forevermore at the right hand of God, but if you walk away from the right hand of God, you're not going to get in on those pleasures. Daily He loadeth us with benefits, but if you miss the... Uh, Loading up party? If you're not standing there in order for God to dump it out on you, you're missing out on those benefits. It's not God's fault. It's my fault. Because I know where the benefits are. I know where the pleasures are. Right? We've had four weeks of some of the best services I've ever seen. Right? And the only reason I say that is because I may have been a part of one as real young that I don't remember that could have been better. But I don't know. I doubt it. But what between here and God moving in and doing something miraculous around here? We, us getting to the right hand of God and saying, Lord, we're just parking in here. This is where I'm camping from now on. And not because I want the pleasures. Not because I want you to give me peace. Not because I want you to do for me what I can't do for myself. No, I'm parking here because you're worthy of everything that I've got. Those that serve God for contingencies or for conditions, that's all that they'll ever get. What did Jesus say about the Pharisee that prayed out loud in the temple? That he had his reward. That Pharisee wasn't praying to talk to God. That Pharisee was praying so that he'd get the applause of men or the praise of men. He got it. But he never got anything that God could have given to him. But the sinner who went in in the corner was smiting himself on the chest, saying, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. He went out having done business with God. He had pleasure that day. He had peace. Why? Because he asked the Lord for, to forgive him. And the Lord said that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He walked out. God had done something in his life. Well, do you think that sinner, what, Lord have mercy upon me, a sinner? Do you think he would have gone into the temple if God didn't have a place of honor and respect in his life? Well, COVID's just, it's been a bad year. So what? God's good. I'll be honest with you. When I'm out there, I don't care really what's going on. All I'm thinking about is when I can get back to God's house. If I could have cut out work for the past month and just been here all the time I'd have loved it let's all bring sleeping bags right, there's, there's two showers over there in the old building y'all may not know that but there are we can rotate let's just stay in the presence of God all the time some of y'all look at me like nah he's kidding I'm really not right but I understand if a man doesn't work shouldn't eat right we all have obligations but see, David, if he could have, David just stayed at the house. He desired so much to build God a house that was still unworthy for God to dwell in. But he says, Lord, I'm going to take the best of what you made on this planet. And I want to take the best that we have and build a place that you can reside in in the land of your people. God wouldn't let him because he was a man of bloody hands. 
But he said, I will let you prepare the way for your son, and he can build it. You know what David wanted? David just wanted a place that was immaculate, right? Never has there been a place built with such ornamentation, such detail, and such devotion to God than Solomon's temple. And you know why it was done? Because somebody loved God so much and gave God so much priority in their life that they wanted a place that they could just go and know, I'm going to stay here all day, and maybe tomorrow, and maybe the day after that. And I'm just going to stay here because this is God's house, and I just want to stand at His right hand. Some days it may be a little dull because He wants me to spend the day in prayer. Well, that doesn't sound very exciting. No, but if you get to praying, and the purpose of prayer is what? To get our spirit in line with God's spirit. And if you remove all enmity between what you want and what God wants, and you just give in to what God wants, you're going to have a pleasurable day. Prayer is not... Okay, let me read my list off to God. I'm supposed to cast my cares upon Him, but to cast them means that I've given them up and given them over to Him. We're supposed to cast our cares on Him so that we can pick up what God wants us to care about. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. I understand God's got a plan for it all, whether I ask Him to or not. But to show Him that my flesh, my desires, maybe the things that I love, or the people that I love, I just give them all over to Him. And instead, I'll pick up his cross and follow after him. We, I, how many times have I quoted that if we love son or daughter, father or mother more than him, we're not worthy of him? Well, how many times when we bow down to pray, are we praying for things that we love more than we're praying for the things that God loves? Again, if, I'm, if I cast it onto him, Lord, I care about these things but I'm casting them on you in faith because I know you can bear them. And I know that there'll be stumbling blocks for me trying to pick up the things that you want me to do and to live as a life. So Lord, I'll just give it to you. But if I keep, you know, if that goes on and that's all that I pray, well, Lord, I pray that you'd really work on that thing that I gave over to you. Well, did you really give it to him if it's still bothering you? Well, Lord, I just pray that you'd move in this situation. Well, if you gave it to him, and he hasn't done it yet, isn't God's timing perfect? They thought he showed up four days late until Lazarus was eating dinner with them later that night. Right? Everybody came to see, yeah, that was the guy that we buried a few days ago. And they're not like mannequining him. Like this isn't the Muppets where they got strings and wires moving him. No, he's really alive. Well, you can say, well, Lord, it's in your hands. But is it really if that's all that you're still worried about? If I start praying contrary to what God wants me to do, you do realize that's what's called grieving the Holy Spirit. If I say, all right, Lord, here it is, and then I keep praying about it instead of getting moving past it, right? that's why he said cast all the cares on him. They're too big for me. But I can do one thing. Allow Him to live through me. He won't do that if I haven't given it up really. If I haven't cast it on Him. I can come to the altar and ask the Lord to help me with something, but if I pick it back up and take it with me, I'm grieving God because I'm saying, alright Lord, I'm going to try and figure this thing out. been trying to for 20 years, but I think I'm going to get it this week. What is that? That's grieving God. And if you grieve the presence of God in your life, you're not going to have any pleasure of God in your life. Why? Because we've done contrary. You know why people don't have the pleasure? They're just not all in. They haven't said, all right, Lord, I'm all yours. All right, Lord, I'm all the way in for the ministry. All right, Lord, today at lunch, maybe instead of going with coworkers, or maybe instead of you know going out to eat and spending 45 minutes in traffic, and by the time I get back, I'm half vexed. I'm going to pack my lunch and I'm going to take my Bible and instead of eating with I'm just going to find me a quiet place with you 
because I know that the second half of the day I'm liable to get a burr in you know, my saddle and I'm a little you know, intolerable to be around. Right? I, I may do damage to my testimony because I'm just having a bad day. But instead I'm going to spend my lunch break doing my best to fellowship with you so that all the stress and all the burdens and everything else that I've got going on in the morning, I can give them to you so that the second half of the day I can be a better example of salt and light. Because I want them to see you and not the ugly side of my flesh because I'm irritated. Right? Or the uncompassionate version of myself because I got so much going on, I don't have time to care for somebody else and their problems. You want to know when Christians were really Christians? When they cared more about what Christ thought and what Christ did and what Christ asked them to do than they cared about what was going on in their own flesh. The Apostle Paul said, I prayed three times. God said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Every time after that, when that thorn started digging into his flesh, whatever it was, we don't know. But whenever that thorn started digging and it started getting painful, Paul didn't start thinking about the thorn. He said, no, I pressed toward the mark of the high calling of Jesus Christ. Not saying you won't have problems, but your problems won't have you. Not saying that you're always going to have an easy day, but it's a whole lot easier to go through a hard time with the pleasures of God in your life. Where was the Apostle Paul during the middle of the Eurachlodon? Oh, he was, he was in the cabin of the ship talking with God in person. They saying, the angel of the Lord stood by me tonight. They were out on the, you know, the deck of the ship trying to figure out where we had. It said that for 14 days they couldn't see sun or moon or any light. They're trying to figure out where are we and where in the world are we headed. Paul's just having himself a time with God. Yeah, it was rocking the whole time, but he didn't get sick from it. Yeah, they were chucking things overboard, but he's saying, Lord, load me up with some more of that. What are you saying? There's a difference between, Lord, you told me to give it to you, so I'm going to give it to you, and let me take up that robe that you gave me as a priest, that crown that you gave me as a king, so that I can do in this flesh the things that you're satisfied with. There's a difference between that and, all right, Lord, here it is. I'll be back in an hour to ask you to deal with it again. That's not faith. Faith is if you pray and you really bore your heart to God, God doesn't forget. Am I saying that there's no sense in prayer? No, the Apostle Paul prayed three times until God answered. But there's a difference between praying and bearing it all to the Lord so that you can relieve yourself of that burden. And there's a difference between that and saying, all right, Lord, I pray that you move in this person's life. Well, if it really meant that much to you, show how much it means to you, to God, by really doing business with God. But then, if you really do it, you don't spend the rest of the day thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to bother you. You're going to be thinking about it. But the reason I pray is to unload it from me. Amen. It's still just as important to me. Amen. But because I've unloaded that burden, yes. now I can pick up the things that God wants me to do the rest of the day. Amen. I will not have pleasures if I'm not doing what God wants me to do the rest of the day because I'm still all tore up on the inside about this. David said, what was it? That there is peace that his flesh shall rest in hope. In other words, I can go through the rest of my day without being torn up about this situation because I've given it to God and that's good enough for me. And tomorrow I may have to give it back to him. But for the rest of the day, I can go about the Lord's business. I can rest in hope knowing that God's got it and he's got a better hold of it than I do. You say, well, it's just been a long time and I don't, well, if you've given it to God... Keep giving it to God. Because the day that you don't give it to God is the day that you're going to be holding on to the thing and grieving God. That may have been the very day that God was going to do something. But because I decided to pick it back up, then God can't do it because I've 
usurped his special place in my life with the flesh. Instead of giving contingencies, instead of just saying, well, I'll help God out on this one, hogwash. He told us that he was the potter, we were the clay. You know what that means? It's hard for me to be something that's an inanimate object, let alone helping God out. He told me to be still and be a piece of pottery. And I think that I can handle something? No. I'm dirt that God breathed life into. But if I give it to Him, and He lives through me, God can take an unworthy vessel and use it for His honor and glory. But I can't do anything that will bring glory and honor unto Him. I got junk all of what I think I can do for Him and just say, all right, Lord, live through me today. That's where the pleasure is. Why? Because I'm lifting up the name of His Son. And when the Son's lifted up, He draws all men unto Him. But when I give glory and honor to the one that God said deserves all honor and glory, then there's pleasure in my life. Not because I deserve it, but because God said, because you did what I always designed to happen. I'm just going to dump out some extra handfuls on purpose. I'm going to give you so much that even though you press down and shake and today you'll be bubbling over. You may think that you add of oil, but when you go back to that cruise, there's going to be enough in there for one more meal. Right? The flour may have been out last time, but there's just enough in there for one more meal. Right? Well, you went to that rock yesterday, and that was a dry desert place, but today there may be water coming out of that rock. Or yesterday the waters may have been bitter, but if you threw the root into the thing, well, what's that? If you get Jesus on the scene, and if you take the cross, throw it into bitter waters, those waters become sweet. The thing that yesterday would have killed you, today the Lord's turned it into a fount of blessings. You say, he can't do that. Well, I've literally, I've worked with people that I've wanted to pull my hair out every time they talked. Right? But I pray to the Lord, I know that's just my flesh, and then eventually end up being some of the best friends I had on the job. How'd that happen? God did something. He took bitter and turned it into, I may have been the bitter one, and he may have turned me into sweet. But whatever he did, he took salt and turned it into sugar. You know when all that happens? When we just say, all right, Lord, I'm out of the way, and you've got everything that I am, everything I will be, everything that you can make me into. It's all yours. And here's all the things that have used to be weighing me down, bearing me down. And I'm not doing it because I desire the pleasures, Lord. I'm doing it because you're worthy of it and you deserve it. And I just want to be yours. That's when we understand, oh, every day's got pleasures now. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm in the valley of the shadow of death. But he's got some treats over here that are pretty sweet. And he just keeps giving me one every now and then when I think that I can't go any further. Or when I'm about ready to give out, he may pick me up and put me on his shoulders and carry me the rest of the way. But at his right, you're at, you're not, you know, you're between God and Christ. We've already gone over that. How much sweeter could it be? But how often do we hinder what God wants to do, prevent God from doing what he wants to do? Because I would say, no, nah, I think I'm just going to try and do it this way. Anybody that ever tried it their way? God may have forgiven them. God may have used them to do something great. But Samson did have his eyes plucked out, pushing a wheel in the middle of the Philistine camp. Was bound and chained into the temple. And he killed more Philistines in his death than he did in his life. But he died with them. I think I would have just rather done it God's way from the beginning. And he wouldn't have been down at Delilah's house if he was doing what God told him to do, which was judge God's people. He wasn't judging himself, let alone God's people. There's a whole handful of pleasures. But we all, we, so many of us miss out. Because we just don't want to allow our life to be a pleasure unto God. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.